Why don't we introduce ourselves? Do you want to start, Brian? Yeah, okay. um, I'm Brian Evan A. Bradley. Uh, I make horror films uh, with my wife, uh, Laurence, who's overseas shooting, or she would love to be here. Uh, but basically, we've done uh, five uh, horror films together. It's the genre we like. And we just finished our last film, Echoes of Fear, which just had its world premiere like uh, a week and a few days ago at Shriekfest. On uh, played two festivals since, so it's been doing really good. Good audience response. Uh, three Best Feature uh, Horror Awards, which we're really happy of. One of them was voted on by the audience, which makes it even more special, because uh, that's what we're trying to do, is get it out there and, and get the audience feedback from it. Great. Congratulations. Hi. Hi, my <laughs> name's Orson Oblitz. I'm a director. Um, I My first film just actually came out today. Oh, it's congratulations. <laughs> It's called The Queen of Hollywood Boulevard, and then a film that I finished afterwards uh, just premiered last month at Fright Fest, Hell's Where the Home Is. I also love horror films, and but Queen is kind of a crime film as well, horror noir, you know. And uh, yeah, so I make movies and convince people to let me make things as long as I can. <laughs> Very nice. Congratulations. Hi, my name is Christopher Ray. Uh, I've been producing, directing films for the last eight, nine years. I've done uh, 70 films as a producer. 20 as a director, I've done uh, horror, action, lifetime, family, <laughs> you name it. Um, just finished uh, directing a women's thriller, and I had a horror film last year called Circus Kane come out. I had one this year called uh, Minutes to Midnight that just came out. I have a comedy coming up. And, oh, and Johnny Gruesome came out today with some of the producer with a uh, gentleman back in Buffalo. So. Very cool, congratulations. I'm Andrew P. Jones. I'm a director, writer, producer, editor. Um, been in the business for 33 years. Started in special effects, morphed into producing, directing, and post. Um, my first feature film I released in 2010 called Kings of the Evening, which was a, his it was a period drama. Um, my next film was uh, Haunting of Cell Block 11, horror. And then um, this year I released a film called Darkness Reigns, which was also horror. Today is October 16th. It happens to be Darkness Reigns Day in Jefferson City, Missouri, where we shot the film, where the mayor nice. actually gave us our own day. Oh, so very cool. And Congratulations. Is that day, this one year anniversary. Very cool. I'm uh, Royce Gorsuch, and uh, first time filmmaker, uh, and I did a film called Mad Genius. It's a grounded sci fi project uh, shot here in LA. Very cool. Great. So our first question, and I'm I, I'm sure we'll find a rhythm to this um, in terms of who wants to answer first. Um, you know, maybe we could just go one way and back the other. But uh, first question is, how old were you when you made your first film? Uh, what did you make it on? And um, what genre was it? Well, for me, uh, my first film was probably when I was 10 years old with a VHS camcorder and a few action figures. <laughs> it was released in my um, uh, living room. <laughs> nice. <laughs> my parents watched it. Uh, yeah. Sweet. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> first film, Super 8. Again, as a as a kid, ten years old or whatnot, in the canyons of San Diego with my brother, recreating Star Wars or a Western or a World War II movie, and that's yeah, never stopped. Very cool. Um, if you go being in it, I was probably one. Uh, <laughs> uh, so making my own film, I actually didn't make my own film until probably 28. And uh, I was still working for the U.S. government, and I did a, a thing called Time of Your Life, which was a five-minute uh, like mafia-type short film. So that was, that was it for me. My first film was when I was 13, and it was like a – skate video on high eight that had some sort of very loose narrative to it <laughs> and uh it was all edited in the high eight camera is, we didn't have editing equipment <laughs> very cool uh let's see my first film was when i was 10 it was a horror film uh called house of frankenstein very original title uh, but uh, when you're 10 years old. So I uh, guess got my friends together. We all played different parts. Uh, it was shot by my dad on an old VHS camera back when they had the separate deck from the camera. 
he was an optical engineer at Magnavox, so he kind of like took it out of the laboratory. Uh, so that's how we did it. I played uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, and did an in-camera transformation because we also could not edit it at that time. So loads of fun. You can see I'm the oldest one because I'm the only one that shot him on Super 8 film. I, I, there, shot, there was I no, shot a Super 8 film too. Did you? Okay. Yeah. yeah but, we, didn't, we didn't have camcorders back then. Was, well, this then, was out of the lab, so this right. was uh, <laughs> this is new. What was your first film where you received a festival laurel for it, and was it worth it? Was it worth <laughs> entering the the festival, and and did you get good feedback? I mean, let's let's shake things up a little bit. Let's let's uh, yeah. W was it worth it entering and and all the festival fees, without naming any names, of course. Well, we'll bleep them out. You go down the line again? Yeah, why don't we start? Royce, do you want to start? Or sorry to put you on the hot seat. We'll we'll switch up. Sure. Um, <laughs> I think my first festival was uh, my hometown, Salem, Oregon, um, at the Salem Film Festival for a student short that I did. Uh, that was really worth it for me, um, just because I was, you know, in high school and. Uh, they were playing legitimate films at that festival, so I got to be there and experience it. Uh, yeah. So that it was a positive experience for me. <laughs> Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> the real Hollywood yeah, story. Here we go. Um, my first movie, Kings of the Evening, did bang up business with the festivals. Opened a number of them, closed a number of them, won tons of awards all over the country. Um, then I started realizing what a business festivals is. That they, they exist on our work. Um, does it help? I, I don't personally think so, unless you're in some of the bigger festivals. And people have told me that, you know, unless you're in Sundance or Cannes or Telluride or something, yeah, it's not going to do much for you. And in fact, I remember doing a panel similar to this. I'm not going to say which festival or which city I was in. And the question came up, what is this award going to do for you, for your film? And everyone gave their kind of canned answers and it got to me and I said, honestly, nothing. That's the true, honest answer. This, uh, this award will do nothing. It feels great. Feeds the ego. It's wonderful. Fills up shelf space, but no, it will do nothing for the film. And that's the way I kind of feel about them. They're fun to do, but I, uh, yeah, I'll pass it on. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Thank you. Um, House is Not a Home was an international film festival and we won Best Film. So that was the first time I've entered and I think I've done it uh, one more time, which was for Mercenaries. That was it. Um, didn't do anything for me. I was at the time I was already in the business and working, so actually helping me did not help me in any way. So. My first festival uh, Laurel experience was actually with my film now, The Queen of Hollywood Boulevard, and when it premiered at the Boston Underground Film Festival. Funny enough, we had actually I had somehow uh, gotten distribution before getting in, in any festivals, so I had already kind of Very like, cool. <laughs> yeah, I had already kind of like gotten there, around it. The festival process for me was a kind of arduous one, where it was a lot of like big festivals being like, we really want your film and then not taking the movie. So it was, it was pretty soul crushing. Yeah. But, um, honestly what I actually had a very good experience with the film at the festival since, um, it built a community around the film and it's built relationships and good press around it and some bad press, which you can use as good press. Um, so, yeah, I think in the end, I would like a lot of my money back from festival um, submissions because I paid actors less than that. But it was very helpful in the end of the day to build a community around the film and help it with its release. Uh, I guess put the difference on this a little bit. Uh, but uh, the first Laurel uh, was our first film I did with my wife, uh, Freezer. That's F R E E Z apostrophe E R, uh, which is about this guy who killed his wife and stuck her in the freezer because he loved her so much he couldn't get rid of her. Uh, and we were actually invited to the Hamburg Film Festival, so they didn't cost any money. Which international festivals, as a general rule, you don't have to pay to submit 
um, because they're funded by government, so usually they don't have to pay any money to submit to those. Uh, but it was a great experience because they, uh, once again, because it's an international festival, they flew me out uh, to Germany. They put me up in a hotel. Uh, I got to meet a bunch of people who were all looking at me like, why are you in this festival with your little tiny movie? Uh, but it was it was actually a really good experience. Um, how much did it help that movie? I don't know. The, the, the festival that it probably helped us the most was our third film, Dark Remains. We got into the, uh, it was the fifth year of a, a horror festival in town called Shriek Fest. And we won Best Horror Feature. And that basically set up like a slew of other festival screenings. I think we did like 23 more festivals. And it did kind of lead we did that for a year, and it did lead to us getting our first good distribution deal for one of our movies. So it can work. Uh, I understand what you guys are saying, especially Andrew. Uh, I think the biggest caveat now is the whole festival thing has completely changed. Uh, most festivals do not program their festival from submissions. They just basically take your submission fee, and that's just the way it is. Uh, most, I would say 85% of the slots are basically producers reps have placed the movie or their studios who already have distribution for their movie and they're just using the festival to promote their film. They don't need it. They already have a release date. I mean, Quiet Place, great horror movie. Why is it playing in South by Southwest when it already has a distributor and a release date? It's a $19 million movie taking a slot of some little indie that someone killed themselves to do. So the caveat to, I think, submitting to festivals is don't go crazy. Don't submit to too many. Talk to filmmakers and they'll tell you which ones actually will program their festival based on the submissions. Doesn't mean you'll get in, but at least it means you have a better shot of getting in because 85% of the slots aren't already taken before they even open it to submissions. So, there you go. Yeah. One more thing about laurel wreaths. I was told by a distributor, and I don't know if you guys have had any of the same experiences, but certain stores, I was told, actually don't like the DVDs having a bunch of laurel wreaths on them because it it makes it seem like an art film, and that's not necessarily their audience, their buyers. So uh, you can get all the laurel wreaths you want, and, in, and then in some cases, the distributor doesn't want to use them and will take them off the DVD because it's not good for business. And I'll, I'll second that, Andrew, because our Dark Remains, which got one best horror feature, the DVD distributor did not want to put best horror feature from Shriekfest on the DVD because he said that they don't care it's a, about festivals. And I, of course, was like, but it's a horror festival. It's not an art festival, but they still didn't want to put it on. So to Andrew's point. That's really interesting because I would imagine without mentioning the name, it's probably a, a large chain that pays. It might be. Pay, doesn't give people health insurance. Anyway, so we'll, we'll skip over the name of it. But um, so knowing that you could actually make money from your film, how did they want you to market it, even though? I would think an art film would be great. Those are the kind of films I love, but it sounds like that's not what sells. So maybe you can touch on how did the distributor want you to make it appear less sort of indie, more? Uh, there is no appearance. They just want the film to speak for itself. They want the cast to speak for itself. They hope that the faces on the cover are recognizable enough and will bring in an audience. So that's pretty much how. No, they didn't want to market it as anything. Other than uh, this one, you know, it was an African-American period drama. So, um, yeah, it just was what it was. Interesting. Okay. Any, anybody else have something to add about? Okay. Um, I, I kind of talked about my first festival experience uh, with my high school short, but I've, of course, with Mad Genius, had the festival experience with my first feature. Um, and... Uh, we premiered in uh, at Fright Fest in London. Uh, we played in Austin and then San Francisco, uh, and had uh, you know really pretty good uh, responses there. Um, and the festivals uh, we don't use the wreaths in our uh, or the laurels in our marketing. Um, the sales agent does use the festivals when he's selling to distributors. Mm -hmm. Uh, as sort of like a uh, you know badge of honor, but publicly we don't necessarily market the festival laurels. <coughs> okay, so there's sort of a time and a place to make the laurels be known. If I could add one more thing on festivals, which I found really interesting, maybe for the first time uh, on this one because we've played three so far, is what I've been using them for 
is, is free audience market testing to find out what people get really jazzed about in the movie to help us figure out the marketing. Because I can tell from the Q&As what people really get excited about. And I also kind of flip the Q&As to the audience. So I've actually been able to get a lot of mar free market research from the festival audience that if I was putting together a, you know, a market screening test of the movie would cost me a lot of money. So that's a little side benefit that you can do to it at festivals which is not going to help you know, necessarily with dis distribution, but at least gives you an idea of what you've got. Because as a filmmaker, obviously, you can't see the forest for the trees sometimes. And you know, movies are for other people to enjoy and watch. So it's kind of important to know what their reaction is That's to it. That's a great point. So you can hear when they laugh or if something just falls flat and you're like, oh, I thought people would love that. And well, yeah, in a, in a scary horror movie, you can tell from audience reactions a lot what scares and what doesn't. But also really from the Q&A is, is great because you can really, from the questions people are asking, you can get a very good sense of what people get really were really interested in and fascinated about in the movie. And, and if something didn't work, you'll find that out too because you'll get a lot of questions like, I didn't understand, you know. So that'll also help you. Speaking of which, does anyone have a question uh, in terms of turning it to the audience for Q&A? Anybody have any questions about festivals or? Okay, I'm curious, have you ever asked a festival to waive festival fees and how was it received? <laughs> I'm sensing there's a story there, Brian. No, okay. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would second the notion that a lot of festival fees are not worth it. Um, I would really focus, you know, on the festivals that, like, do your research as to which ones you think uh, are going to accept you and will benefit you and that you want to be a part of, and all the other ones are not worth it. Um, I, I definitely have done a shotgun approach in the past, you know, and uh, found that it, that wasn't really worth it. Um, and then what I found also is that uh, by getting into one, uh, that's decent, then you start to get invited to others. And when that takes place, then there is no fee and there's, you know, you, you just know you're in. And that's, so it's kind of about getting like a the first good one can really have a ripple effect. You know, and I don't totally mean to knock festivals. I mean, if it's a short film and you're not going to rent uh, a huge theater and it's a great night for you and your cast and crew to go out and you know, then have drinks afterwards or whatever, then it sounds like it's worth it. But as a rule, to try to continually launch a film, that's that's kind of where I was was going and and hoping to hear from. And it sounds like well, I, I think you just nailed it. If you're if you're going to do it, have a targeted approach. I mean, I know some people who are like, I'm submitting to 50 festivals, and I'm like, what are you doing? It's so much money. You could use some of that money for marketing, buy some online ads, or you know, mark better marketing materials or whatever. I mean, so I think. Yeah, what you said, like, target it. Did you have something to say? Yes. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I got to a point where I was, my film was being invited by a lot of festivals. And then I started noticing that I was opening night or closing night. And then when the awards would come up, some film that I, I honestly really thought was awful would win best of the festival. And, and, I, and I would just walk away just going, I don't understand this. I'm, I'm, why is my film... And it was a, well, your honor is being the opening or the closing film. And it's like, but I don't know what to do with that. I, I don't know what, I can't, I can't write an essay on a poster explaining that. I can't, you know, I don't know what to do. So by the last one, and maybe it was a little bit of a jerk move, but I was invited to yet another one. And I said, well, I'll come if you give me an award. And they did. Okay. They, they made up an award special for me and made a presentation and they did. And was what great. festival was that, Andrew? I'm not telling you. <laughs> And look, there were some great festival experiences, and so I'm not going to say they're all. They all use the film. Some sure. are great. Some yeah. are not so great. Um, some were a lot of fun. Some were not so fun. Some were very kind and giving. Um, so yeah, I can't knock them because we had a good time and it gave us a lot of stuff to talk about. A lot of PR. And speaking of PR, um, Orson, you said something about um, you, you received a few negative reviews, which you actually don't think are bad. And I'm wondering, have others received that, or have any of you had your films, let's say, torrented or something? And it actually helped. I mean, we've heard of cases where certain people's films being you know, ripped uh, actually sometimes helps sell the film. That's funny. Um, I actually have not looked on BitTorrent. I'm sure my film is on there because that's the audience is kind of gamer uh, culture. 
and I definitely uh, uh, found a link uh, that surprised me. It was like free movie something something, and I went on there, and and it's like had eight thousand views, and you could just like watch my movie on this like legitimate looking website, and I was just like, that's insane. That's just out there uh, on like the first page of Google. Wow. Um, that so that was really sh- pretty shocking. Um, Good shocking, sorry, or bad no, shocking? No, no, bad. Bad, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, just to think that someone stealing, like, you're like, wow, someone's stealing something I made. That's interesting. Yeah, you know, I, I almost uh, did this uh, thing that I was gonna put on the front of my film, like a 30 second selfie video of myself, and basically. As soon as it would come on, before anything, I'd say, hey, I'm Royce, and I created this film, and I spent three years of my life and, like, put myself into, like, financial straits and, like, lived on the set and, like, did all this crazy shit. And so I'd really appreciate it if you didn't steal my movie. Because, and I didn't do that, and I really actually wish I would have, um, because uh, when you watch my film, you know, I have a pretty awesome distributor and they have a cool logo and it comes up and you look at it and people, you know, they just think, oh, this is just some, you know, million dollar movie, you know, but the truth is that that's the exact opposite. And, but people, consumers, they just, they don't know. And they've sort of been spoiled by Hollywood. uh, And, you know, I, I feel like the value of film with digital distribution has has obviously plummeted in culture, I think. So those are my two cents. What about a bad review? Because sometimes trolls help p- can perpetuate something and, and actually help it. Did, did anything happen where you had yeah, a bad review? Yeah, you know, reviews are interesting. I had, my film is pretty divisive. It's like people love it or they don't get it. It's like one or the other. And I found that interesting because the whole purpose of my film for me was to get people thinking. Um, And I kind of count those as both sort of a win, but I didn't count on people being so vicious um, in some cases, especially on like ratings, like not necessarily press. Press were all fine. You know, they, they did professional work. If they didn't like it, they said why, whatever. But there's like they're the trolls, right? The the faceless internet goblin uh, out there who, one star. yeah. And I, you know, there was one guy. He gave me one star and just like berated me on IMDb. And I clicked on his profile, and I had seen that he he had given a thousand movies one star, including Christopher Nolan's first movie, which is I think incredible. And I, it was just like there's like an army of these people out there. Who, who are doing this and, and they have no idea what it takes to make something. Um, so that was really challenging for me my because this is my first film. I've never experienced anything like that before. Um, so that was, that was challenging um, and definitely made me like humanity a little less, <laughs> I would say. Uh, it does also feel really good to get those reviews that totally get it and they, they speak to it and they saw the subtext and they look through, you know, the surface and really like got it. And those feel really good. And of course, those are the ones we post on our marketing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we hit a couple, we, a number of subjects there. Um, the trolls, the, the negative trolls. Yes, it's very frustrating. Distributors usually always say, don't worry about it. It's, it, it's meaningless. They don't they don't care. The, the filmmakers, we care because it hurts because we put so much into it. There's nothing you can do about it. As far as like home video and people stealing your stuff, I actually have a friend who used to work for a major studio in home video, and he would tell me they never went after anybody. They just It's just part of the business. Those people that are going to dig in and download something and pirate it, they're going to do that. They're not the person that's going to go and pay to watch it. That's just not what they do. So... His attitude always was, it's just part of the business. It's part of the circle of life for a film, and don't sweat it, and um, you're, you're not losing anything. People are still watching it, talking about it. That's what you want. Um, that was pretty much everything, yeah? Great. Thank you. Um, as I say, there's no, there's no press is bad press. 
Um, even if somebody gives you a good or bad review, it means they watch the film. So in that aspect of it, I'm fine. Um, I've gotten completely tore up where somebody tried to give me like half a star. There's one star and the guy's like, it should be less. <laughs> uh, I've had people email me asking for their money back. So <laughs> they're, oh, yeah, no, it was good. Um, I did, uh, I did Mega Shark versus Crocosaurus for Sci-Fi Channel. And a viewer in Spain or something wrote me a thing saying I hurt his brain. I need to, <laughs> I need to give him back his money. Um, when it comes to, you know, so when it comes to reviews, it doesn't bother me. I've been around the business for so long that the guy who wants to sit in the basement, never come to a movie set and see what everyone's doing and, and working hard, wants to complain, fine. If the guy wants to come and work on the set and meet everybody and they'll then still complain, then it's a, it's a different, different aspect to it. Um, when it comes to the torrent part of it, you, in my mind, you're stealing from the filmmaker. Let it be a dollar. 50 cents, you know, whatever we're entitled to for making the film by doing so, you know, I can give an example for um, Circus King, which came out last year. We found a site that had 8.3 million views. Wow. Now, mind you, wow. in, in, in monetary value, even a dollar would have been something. But no, we had, we've taken that down. We've taken down different sites and they've, I mean, it's, it's uncountable. So yeah, torrent sites are probably the bane to a filmmaker's existence. That's, that's just my opinion. Orson, anything to add? I, I kind of took your what you said and I turned it into a question. No, no, I, I mean, uh, I haven't d dealt with torrent sites as this movie literally came out today, but I'm sure by the time I get home, <laughs> it will be on some good sites, you know? Oh, that's good. Yeah, you know, so I, you know, I, have, I have my producer looking out just for fun. Um, but what I was saying about the bad press was I, we just had a review come out by an actual person who claims to be a, a, a some sort of film publication and he had he hated it so much that he actually used amazing colorful language to describe the film he called my uh my 65 year old mother some sort of a sideshow cheap liberace of hollywood wow <laughs> and uh a, the poor man's oh angelica houston gosh. oh no th this is going in our next little teaser we're making no <laughs> i love this stuff so then i i've actually now been doing this thing where i'm like because it's a film that stars a 65 year old woman. She's a total badass. She's like going around, um, you know, LA. It's just, it's a, it's a wild film. And, you know, she's got a girlfriend and, you know, we were doing what we do. We were, you know, trying to do something different. And the comments are, are terrible by the trolls. But my whole plan and then what we're doing is we're just going to turn it against them and say, you know, bang, bang, bang. Look at all these terrible things people are saying go see this movie. Not as if it's a bad movie. It's actually an attack on the main character's look and gender and who she is. So for me, that only motivates, I think, the audience that I want to see the film more to go see it, to support that type of character and that type of person. And um, yeah, so I kind of invite, I, I mean, I'm a little com confrontational, I guess, at times. Because <laughs> I kind of invite, a little, my, my, my girlfriend the other day told me that I was kicking the hornet's nest a lot these days with it. Um, like I'm trying to, you know, really get the, <clears throat> the, the um, kind of uh, Reddit, the, the, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm trying Reddit to think, trolls are pretty a bad. A certain type of Reddit troll community to really talk some smack on the movie. So I can kind of use it, these comments, to for my benefit. And that's what I've been doing. You know, there's these bad reviews come out. I mean, not if, if they have honest things to say that are bad about the film. That's great. Like, I'm, that's your prerogative. That's how you feel. That's, I respect that. It's not for everyone. Um, I don't make uh, films for everyone. I don't think, I think it's very hard for anyone to make a film for everyone. But I'm kind of taking the bad and trying to turn it. And the bad, like we're talking about, like the troll bad, like the, you know, these real, uh, you know, basement basement uh, trolls and goblins and whatever, you know, hobbits. And yeah, there's um, a movie. Yeah, there is a movie. I'm basement sure. Trolls. Yeah, basement trolls. They all live in their mom's basement. They all, <laughs> seriously, and I don't want to hate on them because I think those people might like some of the films I make one day. And I, good, I want to get to you down there in the basement. Um, if they can get reception, though. Yeah, I don't know what type of internet they're using, you know. It's, it's That's why the Oasis Amphitheater is really cool. Yeah. Very good. Great internet and those computers that glow and stuff. Exactly. Uh, but, um, yeah, so the point is here is, like, if they're going to come and they're going to say, 
uh, vitriol and stuff and, and hate on certain elements of the film and things that make them feel uncomfortable. My plan is I am going to use it in advertising. I'm going to use it in campaigns. I There's nothing more I'm, ha I'm more excited to do than put on a picture of our main actress walking down the street in her leopard skin coat, a where it says a uh, a a sideshow Liberace of Hollywood. I can't wait to put that on there. Be That's pretty good, That's right? Pretty That's what good. I'm saying. It's That's cool. I, I want to see the movie now. Yeah, I want to see the sideshow Liberace of Hollywood yeah. film. And to be honest, when you said that, I was like, yeah, I actually, good. yeah, I was actually watching beyond beyond the candelabra when I was at a point when I was editing the film. It was a pretty cool movie. It's a really cool trailer, by the way, and, and it is your your mother who plays the main yeah, character. Yeah, it is yeah. my mom. Yeah. That's okay, sweet. very cool. Yeah, she's wild. Was yeah. it like directing your mom? It was like directing my mom? Yeah. It's awesome. She was, was down. Great. She was more down than I was. <laughs> yeah, she, she, everyone, put her in your films. <laughs> Yo, she's down, trust me. You can push her to the limit. <laughs> she she owns a strip club in, in the film? Yeah, she's, okay. a, she's a strip club owner, mm -hmm. um, and she's had it for, you know, 30 years, and some guys from the past come to take it away from her. It's kind of a little killing of a Chinese bookie vibes. And um, she doesn't go down easy. Okay, all right. And Brian, anything to add? I, I think everyone covered it pretty well. This is such a depressing topic. I think I'm yeah. just gonna bow out of that okay. one. Okay, <laughs> and, and, and one thing to, I don't know if this sheds any light, but if you think about it too, you could, you could also look at the trolls in a way as a compliment. Because uh, it might not be someone in their basement. It might be another filmmaker that didn't get distribution or that's been at it a while and it's more like creative jealousy. So you could also look at it in that light and no. then, no? Okay, maybe not. All right, I was trying to bring some Louise Hay to it and it didn't work, okay. <laughs> Honestly, I think fellow filmmakers, even if they're jealous because of success, they, they know enough about the process of making a movie. I mean, look, to even make an awful movie, an objectively awful movie is hard. To even make just a hideous movie. Even if I hated it, I wouldn't give somebody one star. Yeah. Even if yeah. I hated it, it'd be two and a half, two. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. one of those things where I or know. Or just rated, if you really Right. It. I know yeah. when you're making yeah. a film, I've made plenty. It's not easy. Sure. So if somebody went out and did it, I'm not going to sit there and berate them for doing so. So, yeah, it might be awful, but you can tell the filmmaker from not the filmmaker based on their review. Well, the rating system itself is the, the way the star, you know, that we get kind of, sorry, just bringing up what you're saying about the ratings, mm -hmm. it's a, that's a very limited way to look at if a film's good or bad, is how many people have clicked on which star at what time, at what point in their life, at any moment, you know, it, and, it, and it, it's not necessarily the way that I would go about, or I even do, um, go about curating my own choices in yeah, films. Yeah. That's something we discussed on with my team when we were seeing this, was it, I kind of was thinking of my own behavior, and I was like, I've actually never left a rating on a film, even if I hated it or I loved it. Yeah. So who are, who's actually taking the time <laughs> <laughs> to do this, to like log in and like, you know. And you love film. And I love film. Yeah. But... I just, I wouldn't, yeah. right? And so that's enough on the subject, probably. Yeah. <laughs> happy subject. Happy, happy subject. We do, we have much more. Um, okay, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna shed some, we're gonna have some light come in the room now. Um, did, uh, did all of you go to film school? And if you did, do you regret it? Are you happy that you went? And if you didn't go, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I did go to film school. Uh, I, I went to sort of like a more of a trade school, um, at a documentary program, photography. It was uh, a bachelor, so it was pretty broad, uh, communication arts. Um, we did make narrative and fiction and commercial projects while I was there. Um, you know, if I were to <clears throat> do my career in film over again, I, you know, I don't think film school is, is necessary. Uh, you could basically start as a production assistant and, and really work your way up and, and learn the game, um, which is probably more valuable uh, to you. Um, you know, it does help to have a college degree out there in the world. Uh, I work for my, you know, job. I work in the commercial side of the business, so I make commercials, produce commercials. Uh, but 
pretty much zero people have ever asked me what school I graduated from. Yeah. It's all about the real and the portfolio and my network. Okay. Yeah, I, I did go to college and I got into the film department. Um, and after two years of it, I was I was actually already working in the industry, doing some art direction and makeup and different things. And so I, I kept taking time off of school, and I would go and work on something, and I was doing some editing. And, and so finally, after two years, and being faced with classes on like how many gigawatts it takes to run a satellite dish and all the stuff that it's like, I don't need to know. I don't want to know. Um, I, I dropped out after two years and then just kept working and I've never stopped working since. And then my real training was, I did special effects for 10 years. So my real training was watching Steven Spielberg work, watching Harold Ramis work, watching commercial director Joe Pitka work. I mean, that's where I learned kind of what you're saying. That's, that's the real way to learn it. You can certainly learn the ins and outs and the nuts and bolts and all and writing classes are good, but I heard some awful statistic and I think it was about USC, that arguably one of the greatest film programs in the world, that only something like 1% or 2% of the people that graduate actually end up working in the industry. Some, and, and I might have that wrong, so don't quote me on it, but it was something incredibly shockingly low. Wow. Um, no, I never went to film school. Um, my father was a single parent and uh, decided when I was three years old that he was going to move to California and become a film director. So he jumped in a car and drove across the, from Florida to California, and he's been doing it ever since. So I grew up going to school, going to set, going to school, going to set. Um, at a certain point, I wanted to get away from the, mil uh, from the film industry, so I went and joined the military to try to get away from this, and I ended up becoming a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> Ended up back in the business, um, and I did that for three years for the U.S. Navy. I went and worked for the government for six years and got laid off when Obama did his uh, government contract cutbacks. And then I went in 2009 and became a PA. I was a PA for about 10 or 15 films, and the asylum called me up to be a line producer. And everything is from that point till now. I've done <coughs> close to 70 movies and won an Emmy and some other great Wow, things. congratulations. It's a very cool story. Um, similarly, my father was a director as well. So I kind of grew up um, on set my whole life, and I hated it. And then I ended up going to film school. Um, <laughs> so Roger, I think Roger Corman said it best. Take the money from film school and go make a movie. Yeah. And that was, and my dad told me that. He said, dude, don't go, don't go. But I just wanted to get away from home. I was like, I am going. And... Um, and I went, and I definitely made some relationships there, but you're right. Roger Corman was right. Take the money, go make a film, because what I learned was there was no, there was, it wasn't like I came out of film school, I was like, oh, wow, I have this path to success. It was just like as if I hadn't gone. I will say, and I had to do the same thing. I had to, you know, steal some money and make a movie, and, you know. The, the, the one thing that film school doesn't teach you is what happens if your actor doesn't show up the next day. What happens if the crew member gets hurt? Right. What happens if your DP is sick? Right. You have to negotiate with the distributor. <laughs> all, 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 all that stuff is, nobody teaches you that. And all the stuff you're learning in school is your basic camera stuff, lighting. Yeah. It's nothing to do with the actual people, which yeah. is where you take the money and go make the movie. You'll learn all of that. Yeah, yeah. and I think the one, the one place that I will give film school credit is allowed me to, to incubate creative thoughts and ideas with being exposed to new movies. And for me as a filmmaker, I'm, I'm, uh, I love film. I base a lot of what I do off the movies I love, and I'm obsessed and addicted to watching movies. So it did open me up to some of that, but I would have loved to have taken that film, put it towards a movie, and just gone and made all the mistakes that I ended up making anyway eight years later. Um, I did, I will say that a lot of the big department heads from on my film were people I graduated college with. Mm -hmm. So I did get to have some people around me that were very talented, and then I got to, you know, um, be a succubus and use their talent for my succubus. own for my own goods. <laughs> That's <laughs> no, the next I, movie. I mean that in a nice way, but no, they're very talented <laughs> people, and talented people help us make better films. So, yeah, but do the Roger Corman plan, take the money and make a film. Brian, anything to 
Uh, my dad was an optical engineer, so I, <laughs> I, unfortunately, and I grew up in the hills of Tennessee, uh, a hillbilly, or as we like to call ourselves, because we were sophisticated, we were Mountain Williams. <laughs> uh, so they didn't know what, what the heck to do with me, wanting to make movies. This was like, my whole family had no idea, but they kind of insisted that I was going to go to college. It was like you, you, you were. I almost ran off and joined the circus because I got to, I got to intern on a horror film with uh, Anthony Perkins, and uh, I almost didn't come back. The wardrobe <laughs> department kind of sucked me in, and I, but I almost didn't come back. But they, they, they got me back, and then they said, "Well, you have to go to school." And like, well, the only thing I care about is making movies, so I guess that's what I'll do. And they're paying for it, so I did it. My grandfather paid for it. It was USC. Uh, it was USC Cinema School. And because uh, I guess they had a redneck quotient they needed to fill out. <laughs> and, uh, but it certainly wasn't the movies I'd made up to that point that got me in. Uh, I agree, though. It's a, I mean, it's a different era. Back then, this is really pre-internet. Definitely, like, going to film school back then, maybe there was a reason for it because you could get exposed to a lot of movies that were very difficult to see at that time period. And you could learn from a lot of people who worked in the industry to learn some craft. But that's – you don't need to now. I mean, you haven't needed – Two for like ten years. I mean, now with the with the internet, you can see every movie there is out there. You can get feedback by posting your shorts on YouTube, and you can get feedback from people in the business. They'll do it. I mean, you, you don't really need to do it anymore. Um, one plus side of it is, I guess, I, I did meet, like you said, I met some uh, some great people. And when we finished, we ran off and did like a fifty minute thesis short uh, on our own. Uh, and that was probably, that was a lot of fun and I learned a lot from that. And into the process of all that, I, I met my wife, uh, nice. who I make horror films with. Uh, so, so that weird chain of events, if I hadn't gone, it, my life would have been very different in a bad way. But yeah, I, I, I don't think it's worth going to film school, taking the If you have money to go to, and, and you don't want to get yourself in debt, which is a bad idea anyway, then yes, invest it in, in a feature. But please, 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 please do 20, 30 shorts before you even think about doing a feature so you can make a bunch of mistakes and learn from them. So then you can make a bunch of mistakes when you make your feature, but at least you're making new mistakes. Uh, I mean, people who never really made a movie and they say, oh, I'm gonna do a feature, that's just crazy. That's like saying you're gonna write a novel and you've never written a paragraph. I mean, that's insane, so. Does anybody in the audience have questions? Do you wanna stop for a moment and anybody? Oh, please. I have a comment. Oh, oh good, okay. I know your mom. I've worked with her. You know and my mom? She's amazing. How do you know my mom? There's nobody else like your mom. Where'd you work with my mom? On the uh, attention experience. No, with Darren? Yeah, with Darren. And then she also uh, sells things from South Africa. So yeah. I went to her house, which is amazing, and met her cat, who's amazing, <laughs> and bought some of her amazing South African wares. And no she's way. really special. So <laughs> I do think more people should put her on film. She's brilliant <laughs> and fun to watch. Oh, cool. Yeah, She's not going to introduce herself. This is uh, my guest for the evening. This is Trista Robinson. She's the lead actress in Echoes of Fear, and she's really great. So awesome. any, any filmmakers in the house, uh, check out the movie when it comes out, and you'll get to see what she can do, but she's great. What's the website? Oh, uh, the website of the movie is Echoes of Fear. Okay, so Echoes of Fear com. Okay, fantastic. Oh, please. Uh, so this is a question I think I've developed some answers to for myself in the past couple of years making shorts and stuff, but I'd, I'd love to get your input. What are the things, when you're, when you're making a movie with no budget, what are the things that you absolutely have to spend money on? Food. <laughs> that wins. That, that's wins. I, I mean, at the end of the day, again, again I go back to Corman because that's where my, my father learned from Roger Corman. I'm learning from my father. You can pay the crew, excuse my language here, but you can pay the crew shit. You can work long hours. All these things, if they're fed well and they're constantly taken care of, nobody's going to complain. Yep. Um, we don't normally do it, but that's why your second meals are one thing. The next day, we always try to make sure the lunch is better than it was the day before because we might have worked longer. Uh, I'm a big strickler when I'm producing for a 12-hour day. It doesn't always happen. But you want to make sure that the food, the craft service, you actually pay the crafty person more than you would normal crew member to make sure that the food is there. Um, I mean, that's my opinion. <laughs> um, 
I found that there's certain things that I've just never been able to get around, like a good 5.1 mix or 7.1 mix. So th those are the things that no matter how many people you know, you can get favors from color correction often to, to really get good color correction. Um, those are kind of the last steps that, that I've often just had a hard time not spending money on because I usually, because I can do a lot of it myself, but yes, uh, definitely food actors, good actors. I mean, yeah, a lot will work for nothing for, you know, for free, whatever, but, but you need good actors. They're carrying your whole movie. So, you know, for me, that's where you got to put some money and, and, preferably SAG actors and you know if you can maybe something that happened while on set or before in pre-production that film school could not have taught you for this but since that happened you were never the same in terms of how you prepared whether people thought you were totally OCD but you knew that what you were doing was right because you never wanted to have that happen again and you were probably you were you were protecting your your own production I think, of course, it depends on uh, what your goal is for your film. Um, you know, if you're trying to get your money back, that's a that's one goal. If you're trying to win, you know, or get into a big festival, that's another goal. Um, if you're just trying to make something, that's another goal. Uh, for me, I think by far the most eye-opening moment in this business because I had actually been in the business for many years uh, working in commercials. Uh, I started working commercials in college, and I've, I still do, uh, 10 years now. Um, and I was always on the periphery of Hollywood, and I, I had, you know, no people in Hollywood, and, you know, had a manager, and, you know, talked to all these different people, and I had made my movie and I had real cast in it and all this stuff. But the one thing I was not prepared for and I, that I wish I had done like day one when I got to L.A. was go to AFM. Because that place is the most eye-opening experience for an independent filmmaker that you could have, I think, in terms of this business. Uh, because it's essentially like a giant uh, bazaar where they take over the whole Lowe's hotel and every hotel room is an office of a different sales agent, distributor, producer, whatever, from all over the world. And they're there and they're slinging films. <laughs> and they don't care what your movie's about. They wanna know who's in it, what's the genre, what was the budget. And, you, and you, when you experience that like firsthand, you just, you can't, I, I can tell you this, but you can't mentally understand until you stand in that place and you walk those floors and you see how it's done. It's, it's mind-blowing. And then you realize, you're like, okay, actually the movie business is kind of like the forks and knives business. Like one fork is made out of titanium and one is made out of plastic. And that's how they sell these things. It's really, it's insane. <laughs> For an artist, for a filmmaker, you can't believe that like that's how it's it's done. So when you left that first time from from the Lowe's, um, I, I, did you feel almost like shell shocked a little bit, or w did it give you a new hope because you realized, okay, then I can do this and this, and then I, I felt you know completely overwhelmed, and I don't really get overwhelmed very easily. Um, I'd say cool under fire, but that place it just makes you you feel like wow, there's a tidal wave out there that people are surfing on that like I, I didn't even know about or I wasn't, uh, you know, I was still like inland <laughs> or I don't know how to, <laughs> right. how to explain it. Uh, and I know this sounds naive. I know that it's like, oh, well, of course, you know, AFM and film markets and Cannes and Toronto, that's how they work. But again, you just don't really get it until you're standing there and you're seeing it. Sure, that's great, thank you. I think I've got two things. One is, I think, just learning distribution, because you, you know, unfortunately, I think we probably have all learned the hard way. Um, and, and hopefully you do actually learn how to do it better, that you can actually make good deals and you don't have to be so afraid and, and you don't have to be so eager or desperate. But whether you make money on your film or whether your investors make their money back, it lives or dies on the decisions you make going in, to uh, work with the distributor. So I think those are the biggest lessons that I carry, continue to carry forward and try to make even, uh, to continue to learn. 
And then my second one is um, oftentimes we have to work with name talent, and I've just kind of learned over the years, boy, that experience can be good or or bad. And often on our kind of budget levels, we're, you know, it's not the most comfortable film. It's not what they're maybe used to. It's not the big trailers. And um, so for me, it's important to actually get to know the people and socialize with them before I cast them. It's not enough to just meet them in a casting room. I actually like to go out in the social setting and just see, are we going to get along? Are they, are they going to be able to roll with me on this and go on this journey with me and not complain about it. And, and, and the only way to really, that I have found to figure that out is to, um, to go out with them and socialize a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there's always someone else. So if, if you're getting a bad vibe from them, there's always another actor because we're not talking about the A plus level. You know, we're talking about some really great, amazing known character actors and working actors but there will be somebody else. If you don't get along, if you don't vibe with that person, or you think they're difficult, there there is another person that's just as qualified and just as good. Something that I was probably never prepared for, and no one ever told me would happen. Uh, I can't actually talk about the movie per se, but uh, I was held for ransom. Oh wow! <laughs> um, wow. Thinking of that, the the crew came first, and the cast and crew came first to get everyone away from the the area, and hoping that the company I was dealing with could get me out of there. Um, yeah, that was, you, you asked for a thing that changed it. That's been my barometer of how bad a movie is. It ain't that bad, so I'm doing good. I mean, that's, that's my day to day. If something's really bad. What country was that? Can't get into it, bro. Not even no nope, I can't get into it. It's, pro and it's probably best, that's smart, but wow, I mean, I can't even imagine. I did get permission to do the making of that film. Are you making it? Uh, we, we are actually in the process of writing so far. Right? Oh. There's so many different people who are part of it that we're trying to get everyone's side because right. what I dealt with was different than what the other person dealt with. Uh, I was just the last person to leave. <laughs> wow. Um, so. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Um, I had a moment. Basically, I think the biggest thing I took from like one of my learning experience was if you don't do it when you're on set and when you're shooting, you're never going to get a chance to do it. So I the old had, adage of fixing a post doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like if your gut, if you're like, like I had a, a, there's a one shot in my film queen that I don't have a moment. And every time I watch it, I am upset that I just, I let it all get away from me to not get this one thing that I really wanted. Because if I, if I don't do it, then I'm never going to get to do it. Afterwards, there's no, especially these budgets, there's no real thing called reshoots. You know, there's picking up maybe little pieces here and there. and, and But yeah, there's no fixing it in post. Um, so yeah, so it's like trust it. Like uh, that moment was I didn't trust my gut. Well, I did. I, I knew what my gut wanted. I went with kind of the sway of everyone else wanting to do something else. And I was talked out of something. And I wish I wasn't. And I still love, I mean, it's just that one moment. And I realized I will never let that happen again. Those on those, you know, 12 hours of those days that we're on set and we're shooting in this tight time, you know, that's your time as the filmmaker and it's everyone else's, but it's yours because you live with it forever. And I said to actually the person that was involved that kind of forced it to not happen. I said, you know what? You walk out of here and oh, the film was 12 days. So you walk away in 12 days and you never have to worry about this again. I live with this for the rest of my life. And it sounds severe, but it, it feels severe when you do. We all know yeah. that yeah, these good. films yeah. define us for the rest of our lives. Yeah. Uh, I'll just follow that thread because I, I really like what you're saying. I, I would say in in, uh, in the indie world especially, and really it should be any world, but they'll never do it on the, on the bigger movies because they can just spend money later. But... It, it, on the indie world especially, it's like, uh, and I say this even at the jobs I work, it's like it, really the motto needs to be fix it in pre. You have to fix it in pre-production. There's always going to be surprises in production, but you need to like map it out so there are surprises. It's not stuff you shouldn't have already like figured out ahead of time. I mean, when uh, we, we learned a great discipline, which I, I mean, I'm glad we learned this discipline, my wife and I, because when we first started doing the movies, we were shooting in 16 millimeter is, you know, the CP-16 Vietnam War camera. And when you're shooting an ultra low budget indie film in 16 millimeter and you're paying for that film stock and that processing and that transfer, you know what you're shooting. 
and you figure it out ahead of time because you don't have the film to burn through multiple takes or coverage. I mean, I had, I had boards and basically like if there was a close up in the board, that's because I knew that line was the close up. I couldn't run that scene for it. I was like, no, no, that's the line I'm in the close up. Here I'm in the two shot. Because it's like you can't, so that we've tried to carry that discipline over to the digital age. And I think it's really a good discipline to have. You can always be spontaneous and come up with new ideas in the set and, and seize the moment, but it's always good to like have that thing to fall back on, just basically having it uh, prepped out. So I would say that's, that will really help you on anything you do, is basically prep it out as much as possible. And even though it makes you a little bit paranoid and crazy, you basically have to play the game, if you're producing it yourself, of thinking of every possible scenario that can go wrong. And you'll still be surprised. But you, it, and it kind of makes you a little bit crazy because you're like, oh, I'm going to go here and we're going to shoot. Well, it's like, well, is, is it trash day when you shoot? When is trash day on that street? You know, it's things like that. You have to always think of like anything that could possibly go wrong, which is a miserable thing to do, but you have to. So then why do it if it's so because stressful? Because you have to. Because if there was any way you could do anything else, you would stop, but you can't. Is there a point where you say, this is my last one? Uh, oh, and then and then you let a day go by and you say, well, okay, maybe maybe I'll you know, think about it. And then two days later, you're ready to do another one? I don't think I could do anything else. <laughs> I'm honest with you. Yeah. I've heard that from other filmmakers. I, one person said I could be a busboy or I could be a filmmaker. That's no, all I could I've do. Done, I, I worked for the government. I was in the military. And I didn't do very well. So. You were a hostage. Yeah, <laughs> something. <laughs> there was something there. Um, so, no, filmmaking, I, th I think there's, there's no other option. A anyone else? Well, I mean, we, you know, yeah. You, I, uh, me personally, I am kind of at a point where it starts to feel like a very expensive hobby. And it just can't be, you know, I mean, maybe it can be for some people, you know, if, if, if that's okay. But I think it's, for me, it's always just trying to figure out how to do the business better. And, and um, but no, this is all I've, I mean, literally 33 years this year in the business, and I've never worked in any other industry or held any other kind of job. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, why do this to yourself? Oh, yeah. I think, you know, for any of us, it's it's all comes back to the desire to, to tell stories and, uh, you know, create interesting or unique or compelling visuals and sound and put them into a montage and, you know, have people experience that. I think that that's, that's it. That's really all there is. Um, one of my mentors, uh, he's actually, his name is Charlie Midnight. He's a songwriter. He's a Grammy-winning songwriter. Um, and he, I, I get to sit in on a lot of his, like, kind of sessions he has with musicians. And, you know, he basically, every one of them, he just starts with, like, you have to do this because you love the process of it. And there's going to be a million obstacles. And you just, you have to be into the process. Because if you think you're going to like, you're only going to be happy if you're, you know, Lady Gaga, like oh, man. that, you know, it has to be about the, the process. So, I think that, I mean, I do it, I mean, along the lines is like, uh, it's addicting. It's it's like, I mean, it's like the drugs, like it, um, the, the first day on set is the most like spine tingling, numb uh, stomach curling feeling I've ever had. And then the 12 hours end and you feel like you've done everything wrong and you should probably go jump off a cliff and the next day begins. And then you get in the rhythm and it's like, you're making this, you know, you, this film, this, you're creating this monster or baby or creation or whatever each time. And, um, for me, like it's a little, I guess, masochistic, my love of making movies because it's definitely comes at a price. And I think, Everyone pays their own price, whether, you know, I think there's people who make $100 million movies that pay a certain price for making those. Um, but it's addicting. That's why I do it. And like everyone says, what else am I going to do? Like, I'm not very good with a hammer, you know? What, I, I'm good at <laughs> films hammering people. I'm good at, like, hammering a prosthetic, you know? 
Yeah, I just, I, I guess I, I just add, I mean, I get what you're saying about masochism, but I, I think, you know, masochism, pain is just intense pleasure magnified for the effect. So if you just look at it that way, uh, but just because this thing will probably be online, and my dad hates it when I say it. It, it will be, yeah. Uh, I, I got uh, my first memory when I was three years old was pulling back the blankets in my bed and a skeleton being there and running down the steps. My second memory is my mom chewing out my dad. So I think it's like I've always been drawn to this weird macabre and darkness. And I think it's like what you were saying about storytelling. It's really like you have to tell the stories. And for whatever reason, if you're making movies, it's because you need to tell, that's the medium that has chosen you to tell the story. I mean, if, if, if you could just write novels or be a painter or whatever, but I think all of us up here, obviously, this is the medium which is, it almost chooses you. It's like this is the only, you can try to outlet that storytelling and creativity in other ways, and I've tried, but in the end, it just doesn't work. The only way it works is if it's visual, the visual medium, and I have no idea why that is. I'm hoping we can take a, a break for everybody in a second. We just had one question in the back. Um, West? Yeah. yeah, no, I'm just, I just think the conversation about being in love with the process, and, and I totally get it. You know, it's very self serving and personal, and I get it. But you guys aren't filmmakers in the back. You guys have talked about business, you guys have talked about raising money in festivals. Um, and, and, and that's sort of the, the crossroads that I'm at, which is that the business is changing mm -hmm. and, 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 and do you feel, without being stubborn and trying to be objective, do you feel like it's, it, it's headed to a, a place where you guys have to change the medium of storytelling, right? And, you know, you guys are making films for an audience. Will, will, will the audience be depleted so much where it just doesn't make financial sense for you guys to make a movie? Because I'm, I'm sort of thinking about whether making features is the is the ultimate you know for me and whether i can explore you know whether it's a bunch of short films or a web uh, are you guys and, and you know are you guys thinking about that how how has the business side of it you know the horizon uh, affected your thinking about making the art and, and, and i need to do this you know because i because i totally get that that's a great question yeah. thank you west I'll start down the line again. Um, I'm, you know, newcomer to it. Uh, my film was released, uh, you know, this summer uh, in in America and around the world. And my experience, just in the three years process it took to make, uh, dramatically changed. So when I started in 2015, uh, at that point. Netflix and Amazon were literally buying like every film at Sundance, right? Fast forward to last year and they bought zero films at Sundance. They're the two biggest disruptors in the game. Uh, they have all the studios like, you know, bending in half. So, but they changed literally their buying model w within the period of time that I was making my film. Now, I'm not saying I was like expecting Netflix to come and buy my movie or whatever, um, but it was certainly in the game plan, uh, you know, in the beginning, like that's an option, right? Um, so I think that the business is changing so quickly, it's a little hard to bank on, uh, you know, and uh, that's the main issue, I would say, certainly with features, uh, certainly with an independent film that takes... X amount of time that you don't have a, you know, delivery deadline on, um, and you don't have the resources to meet that deadline specifically. Um, you know, obviously, episodic is undergoing a massive renaissance, but there are also over 500 scripted television shows, you know, amongst the the various channels, so it's very crowded. So, th I mean, I think your question is basically like the pinnacle question for any independent artist at this moment is what is the, um, you know, structure of film and where is the potential to have uh, fiscal return? Because I know that's part of your, your question. And the answer is that nobody knows. So that's, 
that's the answer as far as I know. And I'm sure these guys have a lot more to go on. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, if you look back 15 years ago, if someone said to you back then, YouTube and Netflix and Amazon are going to rule television, you, you would have thought that's nuts. That's insane. That'll never happen. And it's happened. So I think it's impossible to predict. You just have to be smart about it. And I'll go back to distribution. The traditional distribution models and, and deals just do not work in this environment anymore. And so you can't be afraid to say to a distributor, no, that doesn't work. Cause I know I will never see a penny of this and it doesn't work for me. And that's where you say, thank you. And they say, thank you. And you go on to the next one and you can't be afraid to do that. Um, all you can do is try. You can just try to try to be smart, try to see what the trends are, try to see how other people are doing it. But I think it's impossible to, to be that forward thinking and, and, and know what's going to happen or what, what the technology is going to be. So, um, yeah, it's a fine line between doing this for the art and feeding our artistic souls and doing it as a business and, and just finding that perfect marriage. Um, I, I do a thing called production service, which is, so to first answer the first part of the question, you can't predict what's happening or what's going to happen. So to be able to do one or two films of mine a year, and I do the business side of it, which is I do a production service where I work for other companies, I bring my team, they give me a script and the budget, and I go make their film for them. So I still get to create and make a film for a product, but I'm getting paid. Um, to do the indie stuff throughout the year, we pick one or two projects that we fund or we find funding ourselves and we make those films. Knowing that we, we either have a distribution in place or we know a person who will shop it for us. Um, and those people are usually up to date with what's happening. Otherwise, really just avoid making, if, you, if you're putting a lot of money into something, we avoid making something that we don't know what will happen. Mm -hmm. So we try to pick a topic or a genre that will, to this day, still sell. That's why horror, horror never dies in that aspect. So it's, it's a good, that's a good genre to stick with if you're trying to basically make something that you can sell. Um, everything else at that point, action does well. Uh, other projects, you're really just kind of gambling or taking a chance on yourself and, and losing that money to create, so. Yeah, I mean, I think along those lines is, um, we've seen, uh, my first films got released, but I'd worked in the film industry for 10 years. Up until then, doing all sort, basically every job and every position possible, and I produce as well. Um, and I think what you found is, you know, not long ago, the model was that you can put someone's face on a, a, a decent, well-known actor's face on a film, and you get money to do it from overseas, and then, you know, you could bank it off that, and that was that. And a lot of bad movies got made off that, and some really good ones. I think now we're in the state, like everyone's saying, where no one really knows what's going on. I think the two answers that I'm trying to stick to, and I know they're still tightly abstract, but one is keep your costs low. You know, you don't need that much money to make a good film, especially if it's a personal one, especially if it's one that's not necessarily um, cast-based or targeted at certain, you know, audiences. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I really do believe this, that, like, even though it's hard, good films find a way. And good cinema finds its way through the masses and navigates through the masses and has a lifespan that you that it can make money off. But... No, there's so many different ways to diversify now in film. I mean, some of the great filmmakers are just looking at new forms of technology right now. They're not even worried about making normal narrative features, you know? They're looking at um, VR, and they're looking at AR, and they're looking at... I saw a, I, I saw a, a guy I know is a very good television writer did a Snapchat show, and I, I don't use Snapchat. I, I can't even... I don't even like that stuff. But it was phenomenal. I was blown away by how good it was. You know, so there's... A whole world of I think diversifying our content. I think the idea of like, sh of like, uh, branded short feature is going away, and we're entering a new world where it's going to be uh, very audience based. And I think one other thing that's going on um, is is being able. And I ha haven't gone through it yet, but I am definitely have a project that I'm looking at. This is is self distribution. I think 
there's becoming more and more avenues. We all have the same outlets. Most of these distributors, all they're going to do is put some paid ads on Facebook, paid ads on Instagram, cut a trailer that you could probably cut better than them half the time, and um, you know, and make a poster for your film. Like you, you can do a lot of this stuff. You know, maybe, but there's starting to be a lot of programs that allow filmmakers to have access to the platforms mm -hmm. that once we were blocked from. So I think you have to embrace it. I'm a traditional guy. I go to the movies. I watch films uh, in the theater. I'm not a big tech person. I'm not a big streaming person. You know, I love the I love the movie theater, but we can go straight to the consumer now, and that empowers us as much as it also hinders us. You know, it's a it's a yin and yang and double edged sword on that one. But I think there's a lot to be um, taken from that, and I think self distribution is going to have its place very shortly in the industry. Just following that thread, I mean, the self-distribution model, if you want to do it, is already here. Uh, there's basically, they, they call them aggregators, but there's companies out there, um, I guess I shouldn't name companies, but there are companies out there that, that basically will, will take your film, and they don't even take a percentage of it, you're basically paying them, and they will basically pitch it and place it to the different platforms, and they'll put them out there, and uh, they'll just be out there, and then it's totally up to you to spend, I don't know, ten to $30,000 in your marketing and everything else you're going to do so you, people are aware that the movie is even out there. And then, so you can do that. Um, I would say if you're going to traditional distributors, which is what we're looking for right now, is you basically have to find one that's actually going to put some muscle behind it. Because there's a lot of distributors out there who take the movie and they'll just do the same thing. They'll just dump it out there. But they're taking their percentage of your movie. But they're not going to do anything to promote it or market it or anything like that. That's probably the worst thing you can do because now you're losing like 25% of the revenue and it's just sitting out there. And unless you pay yourself to market it, which you have to do as well, no one even knows it's there. So that's kind of happening and changing right now. But there are still distributors, hopefully talking to some, that will actually do a little bit to push the movie that might make them worth you know, going that route. The other thing is, I think what you said, is just keep your costs low, which is all part of like learning. Do the shorts, learn how to make movies, learn every aspect of the movie. My wife and I, we do so many of the different roles ourselves because we've been doing it for so long. It's not like we're just trying to do things we've never done before, but like doing the basic uh, audio work. We go to some place to get it all sweetened, but doing the basic audio work and laying down the audio tracks, the cinematography, my wife's a shooter. She shoots on other shows and primetime TV shows and stuff. And so if you can, the more hats you can wear yourself and do the work, you can lower the costs, and, and that helps a lot. In regards to, like, you know, everything's changing now in terms of, like, there's different ways, like you said, to tell stories. Once again, I just tell features because for whatever reason, this is the outlet for me, like a 90-minute or less kind of feature thing. This is my ideas lend themselves and want to be in that kind of format. Like, tell a story, beginning, middle, and end, that's complicated enough so you need that running time. <laughs> so that, that's just why I do it. If, if I was drawn towards, there's not really money in it, but if I was drawn to like telling little five minute stories and that's what's my passion, I'd probably just be doing that. Uh, there's not, like I said, I don't know how you make any money from that, but that wouldn't be the issue. That, that would be my passion, that's what I would do. But because it's like, narrative feature filmmaking then it's kind of like it's the reverse of a normal business you you don't your normal business is oh i'm going to figure out what the market is and da, 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 da. no it's like it's it's kind of reverse it's like i really need to do this i can't not do this so how can i make that viable which business wise is not very smart but once again I'm, it's not coming at it from that way but definitely keeping calls slow looking at the different options there's a lot of different options now so that's the plus side, is there's a lot of different options. The downside was in the past, if you could get a distributor, you'd be like, yeah, I got a distributor, and that would mean something, because there weren't that many, and the ones that did it could do it. We, like, this is how far back we go. We actually went to the Cannes film market ourselves at one point with two of our movies, because we got the rights back, because someone screwed us over in a sort of territory and didn't tell us, so we got the rights back. So we actually had two movies in a booth at the Cannes film market selling movies directly to buyers, and we did it. And we made money. And we're like, wow, we could do this. But the flip side of that is, that's all you'll be doing. Because you really need to, to be there for like five to 10 years and, and pay, you have to be taking other filmmakers. And then pretty soon you're just a distributor. You're, I mean, that's the whole thing with a foreign sales agent and a good distributor is 
a good one, which will pay you, they have the relationships. They've developed the relationships over 10 to 20 years. And it's those relationships which enables them to make the sales. The same way that the, the film reps and stuff can get a film placed in a festival. It's the relationships with the film director, at those uh, festival directors at, the, at those festivals. So it's really a relationship game. And that's the advantage of getting a distributor if they're a good one. If they're a bad distributor, then yeah, obviously they're not worth it. Well, why don't we turn it over to the audience? Does anybody have? Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, this gentleman here first. Thank, and thanks for uh, coming up. It's been, it's been great listening to your journeys. Um, you've talked about the creative process, distribution, some other stories. But the question I have for all of you, um, financing. Your first experiences with financing and how you finance your first projects and where you are currently with financing your, your dreams. <laughs> you don't always have to start. Uh, I want to hear where you started and where you are now, and maybe they haven't changed much. I don't know. Sure. Um, with, with my film, Mad Genius, um, I did some pretty creative financing. Um, in the beginning, uh, I essentially financed a key part, uh, which was my casting director. And I knew that I was going to make this film of my own accord. And I was out there like super Wild West style. I had no distributor. I had no sales agent. I had no real producer. I just knew I was going to make this movie. Um, so I was willing to, to do crazy things. And so the first thing I did was invest in my casting director. And we started doing auditions of the script. And the people that she brought in because she was so terrific, uh, like blew my mind. I couldn't believe the actors we were getting to audition and to tape and to meet with me because I was literally offering SAG ultra low budget, uh, you know, minimum. So once we had, you know, some really great cast in, um, and cast, I should put a caveat in that like he was saying earlier, the old method of financing your film off huge cast with foreign sales, is that's still out there. It's not as big as it used to be. Um, but you have to have big actors to do that. We're talking like top 100, you know, kind of actors. My actors were just really amazing and had been in real films, uh, you know, like Iron Man and Star Trek and, um, you know, TV shows and they were willing to do my crazy little movie. So that was, that's what really kicked it off. And then that's what allowed me to go then raise private money, um, you know, just enough basically. And I wanted to keep the budget really low because I knew it was a real gamble that if we would make it back. So you, your funding was all equity based on your cast. Yeah, and me as a commercial director, I had a real, I had visual effects experience. You know, I, I was a real package um, for my tiny movie, right? Plus these actors, um, plus the, the genre and uh, the scale of it. And so people said, why the hell not, you know, kind of thing. And then, you know, moving forward, I, I definitely, you know, personally, we'll never self-finance, uh, you know, a speculation project again. Uh, but that's just a, a personal thing. Uh, so I'm looking at more, you know, traditional uh, and through Hollywood routes, you know, for my next projects. Can I do a quick follow-up? Did, did the actors actually write a letter of intent for you to get funding, or was it a handshake? Kind of? It was a little of both. Of course, paper is always better for money people, right? Like a letter of intent. And all, and all that's hard to do because usually there's that whole catch-22 of you can't go out to name actors unless you've got your funding in place, but they help you get your funding in place, and it's that's always a really tricky thing to navigate. Mine have been just a combination of things, nothing terribly interesting from me self-financing to private equity, um, I've been looking into a little more doing foreign pre-sales, but it doesn't excite me that much because you're giving away a lot for very little. Um, yeah, just a little bit of everything. I think it all starts the same way. Uh, I was self-financing the very first one, and then over time I've been able to get together with different investors, and as my 
depending on the project, I can take certain projects from these investors. But the very first one was self-financed. You must be doing good. I mean, if you're going to private investors, hopefully you guys are making enough money to, you know, keep your investors happy so you can keep doing this. I right. am into a, to a degree, but again, it, it's, it's knowing the project that will sell. A lot, a lot of times when I want to make a film myself, I still have to raise my own money because it's, I don't know if it's going to sell, but I want to make it. Where if I have a project I know will sell, then I go to my investors. Um, mine was uh, my Queen Queen of Hollywood Boulevard was interesting. We um, it kind of three three steps of financing. One was we <laughs> my grandma died, which gave me just enough to like pay for some of the crew. And then my, um, my one of my producers' family was very generous. And then a production, com a production company that I'd worked with on a lot of other projects, more a commercial company, um, helped bankroll um, part of the film on a credit card and just trusted me that I would, out of our good faith and working relationship, that I would get it back to them. And I was on like a, I'd had to meet all these like benchmarks with them. And then we only had enough to get through production um, knowing that I could do as much as a post as I could myself, we raised twenty-two thousand dollars off Kickstarter. In the end, I it was you know Kickstarter. We got it was a gamble. We wouldn't have been able to finish the film honestly without it because we had no. A lot of that money went back to paying back the production company that had loaned me the money and all of this and a, a lot of my own um, like credit cards and all this were in it as well and those are still not paid back. <laughs> and um, but. So yeah, it was kind of like a, a, a mixture of things. Um, again, the Kickstarter at the end was really helpful. I would suggest to anyone doing a Kickstarter that I think that is the proper order of ways to do it. Make the film as much as you can yourself. Show that you got something, that you got skin in the game. And really, people followed. People got in line and liked it. Random people I had never met before came through with very big donations to the film and, and investments in it. Um, yeah, and that was that. For my second movie, it was, honestly, it was kind of a dream situation. I walked into a, a ready finance movie that its budget was many times larger than my first one. And not, not as a giant movie, but it was different. And it was more for hire, but it was, a, I love the film. It's a, it's, I love it. So yeah, so I've kind of had an interesting a way of raising money and I'm raising money for another movie and it's kind of like going back to the drawing board again and seeing you know with these showing that I've made these movies before who is willing to you know going to people that I know are either in it for they want to support cool interesting movies they have the funds to do so which there's not a ton of people who do that but if there are you go to them and then traditional um, dis you know uh, financing distribution models to try to get the starter cash to get the films going and to get the smart thing like he said was like getting the casting director because that really kickstarts the film into gear and casts everything on these films even not giant casts like a real cast makes it a real movie and that just starts gets the ball rolling so i think that's actually a great piece of advice is getting like the cat uh, pay your casting director get them on fast and um the movie will start rolling uh, yeah, well, first film, I think this is a common thread here. Uh, first film was, uh, we, we came up with this crazy idea because I wanted to do a feature and my wife's like, well, just do one. Uh, so basically we, uh, she came up with this crazy idea that we would get in, people involved in the movie and part of their involvement in the movie is they put money in it and, and everyone would have a piece of it and we just do the movie. So we were putting in our money a little bit. Uh, and then we went to someone we knew who was a friend who was interested in, in film and wanted to get involved in that. And he said, well, how much more do you need? And we told him, he goes, okay, I'll put in the rest. And that was the end of that journey. So that, uh, that was a very uh, micro budget, micro, micro budget, low budget horror film, even though we were shooting film. Uh, and, uh, you know, his first film, so he gets screwed over every which way by distributors. And we still, because the budget was low enough, everyone got their money back. So... Fairly successful for a first film. Uh, three films in between. Duh, 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 duh. Uh, the last film um, that we did, I basically did the little song and dance where um, 
I wrote a script for someone and, and they said, you know, write it for this budget. So I wrote it for that budget. And they said, oh my God, the script, it would cost this much money, which is exactly the budget you told me to write it for. So I went back and rewrote it for the new budget. Uh, and then it got all greenlit and everything, which I'm aware enough to know that means nothing. Uh, and then sure enough, it just disappeared, didn't happen. Why well, that was a time suck of like two years of my life. And so I'm like, I gotta make another movie now. Because I have this window where like, I start to go insane if I haven't done a movie. And now I was hitting that insanity window. And so I basically had to buckle down. I had this idea that we had talked about a long time. And my wife and I basically said, okay, let's just go back to where we did the first one. We got a lot of equipment now. We've done a lot of films. We know a lot of people. We can do a lot of in-kind, a lot of deferments. And we just need to really raise the money to be able to pay the crew and the actors. And that kind of the key, the key things, of course, food. Uh, but my wife's French, and she's a great cook, so she actually did catering, and everyone was very happy about that, actually, because it was really good lunches. Uh, Trista will vouch for that. Absolutely. So, uh, so basically, we we just decided to to do it that way, and and just uh, you know take the time it was going to take, because we knew it was going to take longer uh, to do it that way, because we were b basically both working jobs in the industry to get the money we needed. So we kind of had to do a little bit of start and stopping because of that. But the movie turned out great. We're really really happy with it. So. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, obviously, the best way is if you can get private investors or get involved with a, a production company or someone who finances it, which makes it more of a work for hire. But if it's the right person who believes it understands the script and isn't going to mess it up, that's a great scenario too. So I think where there's a will, there's a way if you're willing to, to put in the effort into it. On the Kickstarter front, um, of course, with my project, uh, that was an option, right? And uh, a friend of mine who's a mentor, she really discouraged me from doing a Kickstarter because if it fails, it stays there on Kickstarter forever until they take it down. And at the time, that seemed like a really dire thing to me. Um, but since then, you know, three years later and after having done the thing, um, what I've come to realize is that Kickstarter is an incredible uh, way to test the market with your project. If you don't get funded, well, then you kind of realize, well, shit, no one wants to see this, <laughs> right? And if you do and you blow the doors off, it's like, wow, okay, people really want to see this project. And that can save you, <laughs> right? three years or whatever, if your project's not right for the market. Luckily, mine has turned out to be right for the market, but I realized that in hindsight, that Kickstarter can really be like a market test, um, you know, for your project. Uh, that's my two cents. John, I thought I think yeah. you had, yeah. Uh, excuse what, what are distribution deals like? Um, what, are the, what are the important terms that that come up with the kind of like givens that you can expect, or what, what are things you can push back on, you know, that, that like you fight for? And this is an epic question. This, uh, so this, this is, is a question. Epic, this is a whole panel. Your this question. is something you should probably be the entire panel about. I mean, what you, what you just asked is something that takes us years to figure out. I'm, I'm still trying, I've been doing this for years, I'm still trying yeah. to figure it go, out. Go to AFM, <laughs> step one, go to AFM, walk around, get your mind blown. Step two, Talk to as many people as you can about that question at AFM. <laughs> Step three, read everything you can online. <laughs> it's just, you can't answer the question, man. There's just so yeah, much. It, um, for me, it's all about the waterfall. Learn the waterfall. It's where people in the process take their money. And, and that makes such a big difference. All right, no, I mean, the, the question you asked could take us forever to answer. Um, there is... Honestly, man, there's no right answer. There's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. You have to just go out and listen and watch and read and meet. And I hate going to events, and I go because I need to understand what's happening with our business. And again, what you're asking is, it also just deals with how our business is changing right now. Yeah. So I can answer a question to you that I know is happening right this second, but tomorrow will be different. So... Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I've only had to do one distribution deal in my life, but I've been privy to several others of films I produced. Like you said, you can talk about it all day. The first one is keep their marketing costs low. 
just as a rule of thumb, just look at the marketing costs. I would, yeah, I would agree with you. I, I one of the jobs. I'm a filmmaker, and I decided because I got screwed in my first project in distribution. I decided to take a job for a distributor just to learn the inside. <laughs> and in six months, I learned as an indie, the thing that you need to look out for is the marketing cost. Cap them. Mm -hmm. Put a cap in the contract, whether it's 15 or 35, but cap it or you will never see a time. Yeah. It's, it's true. And it's legal. It's all legal. And it's legal. But that's like, that, I mean, yeah, like you said, yeah. like that is cap. Every, every cost inside the contract should have a cap. Yeah. If it's if it's your DVD costs, if it's the PR costs, if it's their recruitment, everything should be capped off at a number. And you, and you need to get out, everything has, all the expenses have to be directly reported. None, none of this like blanket expense thing. Like, oh, 50,000 expenses. What does that mean? It's they got It's got to be like transparent in terms of what they're spending. I mean, a great, if, if, this, if this was like, Ten years ago, I could tell you some great people to go to, but they don't do it anymore, or they've moved up to only doing like $5 million movies. But we had a foreign sales agent who was fantastic. They would actually give you the contract, the actual contract that they signed with the other country they made the deal to. That's how transparent they were. It was amazing. And they always paid. You never had to shake them down. But that's all. Like You just got to ask a bunch of other filmmakers who they've gone with and what their experience is because that's not even going to be reflected in the contract. You can have terms in the contract. It doesn't mean they'll do the terms. And then where are you? Arbitration, hiring a lawyer. So the only other thing besides marketing, I guess one tidbit of advice is make sure there are benchmarks on the movie. Uh, you know, if you can't get it in advance, which is always the best, then get a minimum guarantee, which is second best. If you can't get any, and even if you get those things, you just basically have to have automatic return of your rights if certain things aren't met, so you don't have to go to a lawyer. Like if they want to take the film for seven years, well, in X number of years, and you can negotiate what this amount is, you need to see X amount in your pocket or the rights automatically revert back to you. You don't have to get a lawyer, you don't have to do anything. If you don't receive X amount of money, and same thing, you want it for three years, by the third year, you have to have X amount of money or the rights automatically revert to back to you. So it's done. You don't have to worry about hiring a lawyer and contacting I mean, it's in the contract. It, now, once your movie's out and distributed, you're kind of toast because it's not a new movie anymore. But at least you're not going to be spending additional money to try to get the rights to your movie back. So that's something. Yeah, I, I think that the, the bottom line is uh, if you don't fully trust your distributor, you're better off self-distributing in this moment in time, um, because I imagine your movie is not probably starring a major actor and not, you know, having like major backing. Other questions? There is something about your movie being current though, because, you know, we had a feature and we were sort of dealing with a lot of distribution people and, and I came up against that wall where, you know, like I can sit on it and wait for perfect situation, but by then the movie's going to be old. Oh, and yeah. so, you know, for me, I, mean, I was, I, you know, I had to make, I had to make the decision about let's just jump on this because you, you can't get the perfect deal, uh, especially as a young filmmaker. My feeling is that if it's the kind of movie that it's going to feel dated if you wait too long. I know a lot of filmmakers who fall in love with the idea of the film in their head, and for me, and I'd rather have a, a, a movie that's done and that's rated B than a movie that's perfect, that, that's A, that's either in my head or no one ever sees. So I think that you've got, you've got to find the balance and, and it's about the volume of your work as opposed to getting that one movie out, you know? So that was something that I had to deal with. You know? I had a crazy notion after the process for my film. Um, it wouldn't have worked for my film, but we we're discussing keeping your costs low and your first one and all that stuff. If it, if it were my first one right now, if I was starting right today doing my first feature and I was again, willing to just make it and just whatever it took me to do to make it, I would consider looking at putting it on YouTube and figure out how many views do I have to get for advertising dollars to pay for my super tiny budget? And then how much would it take, you know, to promote it to, to got to that place? 
And you could potentially, because now you're defeating piracy. Now you're defeating the whole game of distribution. If you go in from the beginning saying, you know what, this film is going to only cost me 10 grand to make. And if I get whatever, 2 million views, then I've just made money on it on YouTube. And I don't know those numbers specifically. I just completely made those up. But figure it out. And maybe you could do that for your first one, right? To make something. It's an idea. I mean, I think I think it's a valid idea, but I will say if you, if you want to go that route, you might also want to look into the aggregator situation where they don't take the rights to your movie. You're paying a certain amount for it to be pitched, but that way you can not only get, you can basically get it across a bunch of platforms. Uh, and then that, the revenue that comes in goes to you. They don't even have a piece of it because you've already done, they, they don't take, the thing with the aggregators is they don't take the rights to your movie. You're paying basically a la carte. It's like this amount of money and it's going to be pitched to all these different networks and channels and VOD and SVOD. And if your movie's any good, you're going to get onto a lot of them. And then all the revenue that generates from that will come, will come to you. So it's something else to look at in addition to the, it's a way of basically buy, it's, it's self-distribution, but it's a little bit of a help because those aggregators have, the, once again, it's relationships. They have the relationships so they can go to all those people and pitch the movie and stuff and that kind of. So it's something, to, it's something to look into in addition to like that YouTube model. If you want to avoid traditional distribution. So you all had said earlier, oh, sorry, Robert, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to you. Um, okay, yeah, Robert, please, you have the floor. So what budgets are you all working with uh, in, in your films? Is it all ULB or modified low, low, full press or full boat? My film was, yeah, SAG ultra low budget, which is 250000 or less. Uh, a range, my first one was... Modified low, um, but we shot that on 35, and so that was a little pricier film. Second one, ultra ultra low. Same with the third one, ultra low. Um, but I talk a lot to distributors now, and, and there is kind of a model. A lot of them have a model of keep it under 500,000 and keep it at 400,000. So I'm starting to hear that a little bit more, that that kind of works for them to, to make it back. I've done everything from five grand upwards of five to ten million. Um, it just really depends on the project and if, if the funding's in place for what, which project. Um, my personal stuff is usually between a quarter to half a mil. I'm in I'm in the no man's <laughs> land of the microphones. Yeah, I'm just you know the odd man out. Uh, no, my uh, my first film was a little over a hundred. And my second one was a little over a million. So, uh, if I talk about budgets, my wife will fly in from the Philippines from her shoot and kill me. Uh, I, I'll do our first one. All right, so our first one we did, we see here, by the time we finished and it was all said and done, I think we spent $20,000, but we shot in 16 millimeter. I think when you take away film stock processing and transfer and everything else, I think we were left with about $6,000 to actually do the movie. Other movies are a lot more than that. But the other flip of it is when you give a budget, is like there's the cash budget and there's the real budget. I think a lot of us up here probably put in a lot of like, non-cash budget, like in-kind, which is part of your budget. I mean, your time, your energy, your in-kind services, what you're not paying yourself, that's truly part of the budget. This is maybe not the cash budget, but it's part of the budget. So when people say, oh, I did the movie for $10,000, not really. What they're saying is they spent $10,000 in cash. It's not, it's not really the true budget of what they did in the movie because they're not factoring in their time, all their friends' times who put in time. That's all value. So I don't think there's anything to be gained anymore to, by saying how little you spend. I, I, I don't think it helps you anymore. It helps you to know how much you spent, that you kept your costs low. So, you're, uh, so that means it's easier for you to get your money back. But in terms of advertising it, I don't know if it's a good idea anymore. I really don't. It used to be like a badge of honor like Rodriguez would say how little he spent, which is also not true. That's not what he spent. 
And once again, it's the cash budget. He spent a lot more than that. And then Miramax picked up the movie and spent $250,000 more. And that's the movie everybody saw was a $250,000 movie. No one saw Rodriguez's $10,000 El Mariachi because it was never distributed. As it, that's just what he did to make people put in all this money before what they saw in the theater. But it was still called a $10,000 movie because back then there was some marketing cachet to that. But I don't think it, there's any cachet anymore. Well, we'll keep, this is a happy question. This is a good one. So, yeah, I know. We're, try, we're trying to keep the happy, happiness barometer up here. Um, what is your proudest moment as a filmmaker? What, what, whether it's just somebody wrote you an email that was kind that said your film really touched me or, you know, going to a festival where you got a standing ovation. You know, they're just, what, what was your proudest moment? Yeah, my proudest moment, I would say, has really just been the overall process and experience. I've had, you know, a lot of really amazing feedback, uh, some amazing reviews. Uh, I'm really great friends with my cast and crew, you know, like we're really family. Um, I could call any of them at any time. Um, you know, we've made money. Um, really just the whole thing has been a wonderful experience. There hasn't been any one like massive, you know, moment or anything, but the the whole experience. Um, <clears throat> proudest moment. Um, yeah, maybe uh, on my second movie, uh, which we made back in 2012, it was one of those magical things. We made, I, I made it in Jefferson City, Missouri, um, at an old abandoned, not abandoned, a prison, a very, very old prison. And none of the actors, that the L.A. actors that I flew out there, nobody knew each other. I didn't know any of the crew. We, you know, I mean, it was all, we were all new to each other, but still to this day, what, five, five years later or whatever, um, we're really good friends. It's just that same kind of family thing. I mean, really good friends. The actors have all stayed friends. I've stayed, I mean, genuine friends, not just, you know, location friends for a year. Um, and even with the, the people of the city and, and the mayor and, you know, I mean, it's just like, it's just like we're all really close and it was a very unique experience because not every movie is like that. You're all, there's a little love affair for like a year and then you all move on and start your affair with your next crew, you know? Um, so yeah, so that, and, um, also just a little personal thing on, on Kings of the Evening, um, my composer, Kevin Tony, he got a, an email from Paul Williams, very famous composer, head of ASCAP, who um, just said very nice things about the score in the movie. And that was just one thing for me, my little geeky thing, because he, you know, Paul Williams did all the music for, for the Muppet movie and, and, you know, just very famous songs. And so that was a little personal just triumph for me. Um, probably last year. Uh, I did a, I had some friends of mine who were finishing up a show called The Bay and, on Amazon, and they had, um, they, had some, they had some troubles towards the end of their, their third season, and I stepped in to kind of help them finish it. Well, in return, they gave me a producing credit, and by chance, they ended up winning an Emmy. Oh. Oh, wow. So with that, and then my 14-year-old daughter was my date. Oh, so for wow. me, that was my proudest moment. Wow, that's a cool story. Very nice. Um, mine was when my film world premiered in Boston at, I went to college in Boston at the th first theater that I went to in Boston to see a movie when I went to college with my mom on stage with me. Awesome. And uh, yeah, it was pretty wild. And she's had kind of a interesting journey. So it was nice seeing her up there in front of everyone. It's cool too. That's great. Um, yeah. I, I would say it, it is this last film uh, echoes a fear that we just started showing a week and a half, we just finished and just started showing a week and a half ago at festivals. And I say that because this is the fifth film by uh, my wife and I, which feels like just an incredible, with all the experiences over the years, accomplishment to get to that, our fifth horror film together. But this is also the first one, we've always been kind of, a, we've always been a team, but this is the first one she's officially co-director on. And it's also the best movie we've ever made. And I 
don't think that's a coincidence. So it, to me, it's like a really proud moment that we totally have just fused it to the point where it's like our movie, absolutely 100% completely. And then to get the best response we've ever had before for a movie from that, with the with the three festival showing the three awards, but more than the awards, it's the audience reaction from a hardcore horror audience to see them respond so excited to the movie is such a validation in terms of what we've done. Because like I said, we've worked on it so hard and so long. You can't see the forest for the trees. You know what your intentions were, but what matters is how people react and respond to it. So to see that response from the exact audience that we're trying to reach. I think to me was is has been the most rewarding thing, and and having that happen with my wife has been great. Cool, thank you. Does anybody else have have other questions? I I don't want to. You're gonna drain us. We'll have nothing left. <laughs> no. All right, just one last wanna, fun. Wait, oh no, one please go for it. Go for it. Because. Of, I also met my wife on, on my first movie. So. Oh, nice. Yeah, you better nice. add that. You better nice. add that. So, i proud. It's, it's more like more, you know, the, the best thing. Maybe sure. call it proud. But yeah, I cast okay. her as the lead in my, in my first movie. And that was 11 years ago now. And we have the most amazing little four-year-old, almost five year, oh. years old. And, um, so that's good casting. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> well, my casting director actually takes credit for our child. Oh, okay. Nice. Wait, did they get a percentage? No. <laughs> no. Good. But I said, send her to college. Okay, last, just what movie do you wish you had made and it pains you to this day that you didn't make it? And it's not yours, it's someone else's. <laughs> this is supposed to be an easy, fun, light question. <laughs> Whether it's Apocalypse, you know, whatever, and it just for you, just you can just say one title and that's it, and move on, pass the mic. Oh, you, you mean like a, a movie someone else did that you wish you'd made that movie? Right. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I yeah. I thought you were asking. Right, right. Sorry. Where it just pains you. You you you, you yeah. know the better. You know the movie almost as good as 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 well as the filmmaker does inside and out. I wouldn't say I know the film as well as the filmmaker, but Fight Club. Um, the sappy side of me really loves Love Actually. Oh, nice. I just find it to be a perfect movie, and um, but also about Schmidt. Oh, I love that film. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying I should ever make anyone else's film, um, but I will say uh, uh, Die Hard's always great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would never make as good a film, but it, Taxi Driver. I honestly don't know how to respond to this question because all the movies I really, really love, I think they were done by exactly the right person who did them. So I, 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 can't, I don't think I can really answer that. What if you could go in a time machine and become that person? Who would but, it be? But, but is there a movie? I mean, it's if you yeah, could morph I, I, into I them. I can't even think. Of, okay. I can't even think about that. Fair enough. All right. Well, thank you guys. We, you know, this is fantastic. We were hoping to do a panel uh, and and film it, and um, it it's been wonderful to have all of you here. And this was our second one, so thank you for making this special because um, this is all new and we have our own growing pains with it. So this was very cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the audience. Thank you.